I'm glad we're starting late because if I go short, then we'll be on time. <laughs> uh, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, so I took, a, I took a selfie with the with the thing, and I'm really bad. Like I'm really bad at making slides, as you can probably tell. They're not very great, especially this. Like this, you're never supposed to do like a vertical photo. So I rotated it to horizontal. But it still, it still doesn't it still doesn't look very good. Uh, anyway, as Jeff was saying, my name is Aaron Patterson. <laughs> I'm also known. I'm also known as Tender Love, and this is what I look like online. This is my online <laughs> online photo. That's me. Uh, I have two cats that I love very much. This one is Gorbachev Puff Puff Thunder Horse. He is adorable, and I love him. This is the other one. Her name is SeaTac. SeaTac Airport, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Snapchat. <laughs> and we just named her that because she does not care about her name at all. So that is that is her name. Uh, and I also noticed that we have some cats out here on, on the building, which I think is very, very cool. So yay, yay, cats here. Uh, and also I have, so I have brought stickers of my cats with me, so if you want to come say hello to me and you don't know what to say to me, say, Aaron, may I have a sticker? And I will just say, yes, here, have a sticker. And then you can either end the transaction there <laughs> or ask me other stuff if you want. Um, I am, I am in fact on the Ruby Core team, which is responsible, the team responsible for developing the Ruby language. I am also on the Rails Core team, uh, which is responsible, the team responsible for developing Rails. And you may even remember me from such talks as Katrina's talk yesterday, where I am in fact famous for remembering the maximum sign 32 bit integer, <laughs> which is this. <laughs> Uh, I work at a very small company called GitHub. Uh, you may have heard of it. We got acquired recently, and I actually had to change my desktop background because of that. <laughs> uh, it, is the, it is the only legit company I've ever worked for. <laughs> I love Git, but I will not force push it on you. Uh, so people tell me that I really need to uh, branch out on my funds. Uh, but honestly, it's just so easy because, like, uh, oh, sorry, it's just so it's just so easy because we have it's another Windows joke. <laughs> it's just so easy because we have a pun channel work, so I can just like go in there and like like cherry pick. <laughs> but what I, I guess what I'm really trying to say is like buy our stuff and come work for us, etc. So anyway. <laughs> anyway, yesterday, yesterday Nick gave a very interesting talk, and he was talking about self-promotion, and I decided that I needed to do more self-promotion. <laughs> so I had a meeting with my boss, and I told her that I would like to promote myself. <laughs> and she told me, unfortunately, I just can't give myself a promotion like that. So. I thought, all right, well, I guess I'd better do better. I'd better do different different type of self promotion. So this morning, I I took my selfie and tried to airdrop it to people. Zach McClane. This is the type of self promotion you two can do. <laughs> Anyway, I love I love going to networking events, especially wireless networking events. But unfortunately, the Wi-Fi <laughs> the Wi-Fi doesn't work here so well. <laughs> so I decided to do personal networking and tether with my cell phone. <laughs> Sorry, I don't write I don't write any of these jokes for you. They're all for me. <laughs> Anyway, I love like I love local. I love supporting local businesses and local local stuff. Every time I go to a new place, I try to have like local local things there. So yesterday, I decided to have a local beer. <laughs> the taste of the Rockies. <laughs> it was delicious. <laughs> so thank you. All right. So I'm from I'm from Seattle, which is um elevation is. 187 feet, so it's very close to, pretty close to sea level. Uh, here, I, I, we're here in Denver. Denver's elevation is, Denver's famous for being a mile high city, and we're around 5,000 feet up here. And it's actually really good for us speakers that are coming from out of town, because it means that 
uh, we had we were under a lot less pressure. <laughs> from Europe and stuff, so feet doesn't make sense, so I translated this into furlongs. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Thank you, Jeff, for having me. I really appreciate it. You're letting me waste all these minutes <laughs> out of it. So, so one, one thing I wanted to do though is like, how, how many of you are here from Turek? How many of you graduated from Turek? Yes, yes, that's amazing, amazing. Congratulations, that's really awesome. You, you, you passed Turek tennis. <laughs> and you are now Turek complete. <laughs> Sorry, I need to promote. I feel like Jeff isn't doing enough promote self promotion here. So I do it. <laughs> okay, all right, all right. Let's actually talk about some technical stuff. You paid good money to be here, so I feel like I probably have to do that. All right. Uh, so this talk is titled "The View Is Clear From Here." I'm going to be talking a bit about Ruby, and I'm also going to be talking a bit about Rails. So we'll talk about Ruby stuff and Rails stuff. Uh, I need to warn you, there will be code, there's going to be code in my presentation, there will be Ruby stuff, we'll talk about Ruby, there will be Rails stuff, we'll talk about Rails, and I know some of you here are not necessarily Ruby or Rails engineers, but I also want to prevent, present some just general software engineering practices too, so that uh, if you don't do Ruby or Rails, at least you can implement these practices in your own projects too. Uh, so Rails is an MVC framework, and for those of you that don't know, MVC stands for Model View and Controller. Uh, and the way that these components actually work together inside of a Rails system is, uh, first a request comes in, uh, the controller handles the request, the controller asks the model for data, the model returns data back to the controller, the controller passes that data to the view, uh, the view renders some HTML, passes that back to the controller, and then finally sends it up to the, whoever made the request. Now, many years ago, I worked for a company that was um, building a system to do pop-up blocking. Uh, and the system that we developed there was, it was, a, it was basically a pop-up blocker, but we actually called it a, um, a modal view controller. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jeremy. <laughs> it controls modal views. <laughs> this is different from normal MVC. I'm glad I got one person. Okay, good. <laughs> All right, so in Rails, the different parts of the system are here we have the controller that's called action controller, the model area that's called active record, uh, the, view, the view area that is, that is action view. Uh, today we're going to focus on the, like I usually, I typically work on active record and if you see many of my presentations I'll be talk, I talk a lot about active record. But uh, today I want to focus on the view layer which is the, this action view area here. That's, that's the place we're going to talk about today. So, let's click on click. As I said we're going to talk about action view. Action view has a few different responsibilities. Basically what it does is it finds templates uh, compiles the templates and then executes the view the views and we're going to learn about all these different processes and the first part we're going to talk about finding templates in detail but essentially action view will look for files on your file templates on your file system and then compile them in other words it will traversal your file system <laughs> yes <laughs> your pain energizes me <laughs> So let's talk, let's talk about these view templates. Uh, in Rails, we use, use a thing called ERB, and by default, Rails uses ERB. We're going to talk about ERB today. Uh, but in general, all the things I'm going to say here apply to all templating, templating languages, not just ERB. So ERB was originally developed by uh, M. Secchi. Uh, he also developed a DRB module, which you may have used. Uh, this is an example of an ERB template. So basically we just have some HTML tags here and then a couple of these special tags which 
all they do is they uh, call a function and then return the value and print that out. So this is what a, this is what a template looks like. Now, the way that we, if, you, if you've done any Rails development, I'm sure you've seen this. Uh, the way that we actually compile these templates is we use ERB like this. We just say, hey, read in the file, call erb.new, that actually compiles the template. And if we say puts template.source, we can see the source code of the template, and then we can actually evaluate the template. Now, all compilation does is it takes that template that looks kind of like HTML and it converts it into a Ruby program. That's all it does. So if we look at the source, if we actually print out that source, it'll look something like this. So this is the compiled source, and it, I mean, it's not the prettiest Ruby code that you've ever seen, but it really is just Ruby code. And if we execute this, we're going to get an error. Uh, but the reason we'll get an error, and it's pretty clear from this code, is we haven't defined a render form function or a link to function. So when the code executes, it's going to blow up there on those lines. So in this example, what I did is I just defined the render form function and the link to function. These are just functions. And then we can actually execute the template, and it'll uh, output the template, uh, the results of the template. So we can see from the output, uh, this, is, this is just a return value of it. So you can compile a template and execute it all outside of Rails. Now, I want to talk about a little strange and not fun challenge when building a templating system, especially inside of Rails. Uh, and we saw that ERB has a couple translations. There's two. There's the one up at the very top that it just executes something and then outputs the data, the return value of that execution. So whatever you, whatever Ruby expression you put in there, it runs it and then outputs the return value. Then we have another one here, that second one, all it does is execute some Ruby code. It doesn't output the return value at all. It just executes it. So what I want to show here is a, a challenge for capturing blocks. You may have seen something like the right-hand side over in a Rails application where you can capture what's inside that block and then output it, output it later. So if we execute this code on the left-hand side to run this template, what is the output going to be? I, I don't want you to answer it. Just think about it. Well, think, think about what your answer might be. Is it, which one of these will it be? Well, it's actually going to be a syntax error. I'm going to show you why. So this is what the compiled output looks like. We can see here we have that capture do, and then it tries to do a 2s on that, and then later on we have this end that doesn't actually go along with the do. And the reason is because if we look at these ERB, these ERB tags, ERB isn't smart enough to know that that's actually a block. It just does a straight translation. So it's translating it straight over into the, hey, call this function, and then just print out the results. And then the end is being translated into, hey, just call this function. So ERB has no idea about Ruby code itself. So that's why we'll get, a, we'll get a syntax error here. But how does this actually work in Rails? Like, how does this actually work in Rails? What Rails has to do is Rails has to detect that inside of that, that ERB tag that you're actually calling a block. And I'm going to show you how it does this. I don't want, like, don't read this, you don't need to understand it, I'm just showing you that what it does is basically parse the Ruby code in there looking to see, hey, are they calling a block? So it's possible to trick it and possible for it to get it wrong. Don't read this, don't understand it, it just does it. That's what it does. <laughs> so we've gone down, we've gone down a rabbit hole a little bit. I want to step back, like I want to step back a little bit getting a little too into the weeds there. I want to step back and talk about different ERB flavors. Uh, there's a few different flavors of ERB. There's the ERB that's the original one that ships with Ruby. Uh, that's the one that we've been talking about. There's another one called the eRubies, or eRubies, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Uh, that's the version that Rails used for a long time. At first, Rails used the ERB version, then we switched to eRubies uh, because it was faster than ERB. And then now a new one is out called eRuby, which is faster than eRubis, and Rails now uses that third, that third one. Uh, it's faster than the, than the previous two. But they're all compatible, so like you, you don't notice a difference. You just write your ERB and it works the same, basically. So let's talk a little bit about ERB performance. Uh, I don't want this to be Rails specific or actually temple language specific. It's not specific to any language or template. Um, but we're going to talk about speeding up ERB, 
But you can apply these techniques to any templating language that you have. So here we've got an example where I'm just going to render a template like we did in the previous slides. Uh, it just renders, executes the template, and then times it. It sees how many times we can render this template per second. And if we execute it, we can see we can render this template about uh, 27,000 times per second. So we can do better than that. And the way we do better than that is we actually cache this. We say, hey, well, every time you call erb.new on that same template, it's going to have the same results. So we don't actually need to do that thing over and over again. We can just do it once and then evaluate the template. So in this case, we compile it once and then evaluate the template each time, each time we execute. If we compare that, uh, we'll see in this case, uh, the original case is still rendering about 27,000 times per second. Here we uh, were able to get a 2x performance boost and render it about 63,000 times per second. So if we skip that compilation step, we can get a good, good performance boost out of this. Now, we can go even further Every time, we, every time we actually evaluate that template, we're calling the eval function. And calling eval isn't actually a very cheap, cheap operation to do. So what we can do is we can actually cache that eval, that eval statement. And the way that we're going to do that is, this is, we'll zoom in on this later. Don't worry, you don't need to read it too closely. Uh, basically what we do is we take that Ruby code and we define that Ruby code from the ERB template and define a method that contains that, that Ruby code and then execute it. And if we do that, we're, <clears throat> we're essentially caching the eval. We define a method rather than eval each time. And if we compare all those together, we're still doing about 27k for the original per second, 65k for the, the uh, cached compilation. But for the, the method call version, uh, we're doing about 1.4 million times per second, which is 52 times faster than our original. So this is the technique that Rails actually uses for rendering your ERB templates. It generates methods from those ERB templates. And we're going to look at, uh, take a closer look at that because I think it's kind of important. Basically, this is, this is what it basically does. We have a template at the top, we compile it, and then we turn it into, we turn it into a method, and we only do that once. Then every time we render your template, we just call a method each time. So here we have the template source. The template source gets compiled here. The compiled source is turned into a method here, and then we just call that method. This is what the, if we were to print out the method source, it would look like this. It just looks like a normal method, and inside that method body is the stuff we saw from the ERB compilation. So later on, we can just call that method each time rather than defining the method. So simply put, templates are translated into methods in Rails. Now, since we know these templates are translated to methods, we can do a couple things with that, interesting things with that information. Uh, one, if we, if we execute this, like let's say we put this template in Rails on the left-hand side here. Just put that in Rails, and you print out all the methods that are defined, you'll see in the console output a bunch of these strange-looking ones, strange-looking method names that are like app view users, blah, 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 blah. But you can actually see these generated methods. So we can see that they're generated. The other thing that we can do is we can measure their size. So we can say like, okay, uh, how much memory does this particular template take? Not when it's executing, just when it's sitting there doing nothing. How much does it take? Uh, and we can do that by just saying, hey, give me the method, and we can ask the uh, Ruby VM for the instruction sequences for that method and then measure the size of those. And in this particular case, it's about uh, 1,200 bytes. And if we increase the size of the template, the number of bytes will get larger, but we can actually measure the amount of memory that our templates are taking. So let's talk a little bit more about uh, template handling in Rails. Uh, everything we've talked to, everything we've spoken about up until this point are just techniques that we can do in Ruby. They're not Rails specific. They're techniques that Rails uses, but you can use them in your own framework if you would like. Uh, <laughs> So now that we know, like now that we know how these how these methods are how these templates are compiled, it gives us some insight into how like certain behaviors about the templates. So from here on, we're going to talk about behaviors of these templates inside of Rails, specific to Rails. One thing is instance variable visibility. So say you have two different templates and you access an instance variable. We know that between those two templates, they can both access that same instance variable. And the reason they can do that is because they're just, we just define two methods on the same class. They're just regular methods. 
And we know that, that regular methods on the same class can access some instance variable. And since it's the same instance, we know, oh, this is the same instance, so we can access an instance variable on it. Like it's a regular class because it is a regular class. Now, that being said, don't use instance variables in your templates. Uh, you can quote me on this. Don't use instance variables in your templates. <laughs> and the reason, the reason I say that is because if you look at these two templates, you have to ask yourself, like, who defined that instance variable? Where did it come from? Do I need to execute a different template before this template in order to get the instance variable that I need? So don't do this. Use, use local variables. In fact, um, at work, so we're going to talk about local variables now, but at work in our application, we don't allow the use of instance variables in templates, specifically because of the reasons I told you before. They're essentially globals in that you don't know where they are defined, you don't know where they are mutated, you don't know what order things are being executed in. So it's best to avoid them, and that's, what, that's one thing that we do at work is we, we don't allow that, and we use linting to prevent people from using local variables in the templates. So let's, or excuse me, instance variables in their templates. So let's talk about local variables. Rendering locals looks something like this. In this case, we are rendering a, we're rendering a template called content, and we're passing in some locals with a name, uh, with a name, and that's Gorb and Maquette. <laughs> but we have, we have kind of a problem here. Like, let's say, let's say, let's look at that content template. So this is what the content template looks like. It says, hello, name, right? Now, we have a problem here in that uh, let's actually let's take this template and given the techniques that we used earlier, we know that it's compiled to a method, but let's look at the method that it's turned into. So this is the method that, that it's turned into. But there's an issue here. This name here, that name is actually a method call. We don't see any local variable named name. So if we executed this, we're going to get an error. Ruby is going to try to call the method name, and that doesn't exist. What we wanted was a local variable. So we need a scheme for defining local variables inside of these generated methods. So the way Rails does this is it defines a preamble that declares all of these locals. So in our previous example, we had this content where we say, hello, name, and Rails will say, all right, we're going to define a pre excuse me, we're going to define a locals preamble here. We have a preamble that basically says, I'm going to declare a local variable named name, and it gets it out of this hash here. So the hash is passed in from the outside template. But what this means, this, this particular technique uh, causes a couple problems for us, and one of the problems is that the templates require context. If we look at this template, like if we look at this template in uh, isolation, without knowing who's calling it, we can't tell, you and I can't tell, is that a local variable or is that a method call? We don't know. And neither does Ruby. And the only way that we can know this is by knowing about the calling context. Is this a method call or a variable? It's hard to tell. So if we, have, if we look at the calling templates, transition, there we go. So we're seeing in this, in this particular case, we can actually mix and match this. In the first case here, we have a local variable named Gorby. We're actually passing a local variable, but in this case, it's actually a method call. We don't have a local, it's gonna call a method. So the issue with this is we can't compile templates in advance because we don't know the context within which they are being compiled. So we don't know, is this a local variable that needs a preamble or is this just a regular method call that doesn't need anything? So we have to actually wait until somebody says, hey, render this template before we can go compile it. So this is bad for servers like Unicorn because it means that we can't compile all the templates in advance. Each child process has their own, own version of the template and it'll use up more memory. So it's not very good. The other problem with it, it's not very good for memory usage. The other problem is that we can end up compiling the template too many times. So, for example, let's say we have th this situation where we say render content, and in these two cases, we're passing different locals to the template. In the second case, we're passing a friend local, but maybe the template doesn't use it. Maybe it's, not, it's never using that, that local variable. But if we look at the compiled content, the compiled methods, we'll see here we have two different locals, two different preambles. We have one for the name, in this case, and in the second case, we have one for name and friend. But we have to generate two different methods because we have two different locals, or two different uh, local preambles. So 
this is not good for memory usage because now we have, obviously we have two different cases where we could only just have one. So you may be asking yourself, Aaron, this is nice. This is fun and informative. Fun, interesting information. I'm engaged <laughs> and enjoying your talk. <laughs> but what am I going to do in my application today? So we talked about this problem of we talked about this problem of uh, lack of pre-compilation and multiple comp multiple compiling templates multiple times wastefully. Now there's nothing you can do you as developers can do about the the pre-compilation, but that's something that that's something that the Rails team we me and the other folks on the Rails team are working, working on a solution for. But as far as the uh, comp compiling templates multiple times wastefully, there is something that you can do, and that is to make sure that when you render a template, ensure that all the locals have the same signature, essentially. Make sure they all have that, the same hash. That way they only get compiled once. So always pass the same locals to individual templates. So let's take a look at the render function next. Uh, at the very high, very high level, the render function basically finds a template, compiles a template, calculates a method name, and calls the method. And we, we saw all this, this entire process. Uh, if we look at it from a logic graph here, whatever these are called, we find a template from the cache. We ask, hey, have you been compiled? Uh, if not, then we'll compile you. Uh, if you have been compiled, then we'll just call the method. That's it. So finding a template, this is, this is the other piece of the puzzle. We've learned about how templates are compiled and run. Uh, the last bit is to just how do we actually find these templates. And finding them, to demonstrate finding issues with finding them, I built a little test application. And templates that are rendered depend on the requested format. Oops, oh, uh, <coughs> I go back? OK. Templates rendered depend on the requested format. Rails tries to figure out what template is rendered based on the content type that is sent. So for example, we have a controller here, the user's controller, and it renders the index template. So by convention, we look under the user's view, because this is the user's controller, and the action is index, so we'll, well actually we're saying please render the index, so we'll look for the index template. But in this case, in our application, we have two, we have an index.html and index.erb and index.xml.erb. So here's the content of those two templates. One just says XML template, the other one says users. I probably should have made that HTML. Sorry. <laughs> Please remember that that is HTML. <laughs> so if we change the accept headers, we say, hey, we want HTML or we want XML, we'll get different views rendered depending on that accept header. So here's essentially a table of what we say. Say we'll, we'll do a curl for XML. The response is XML. Uh, we render the XML template. If we curl without any headers, we'll get HTML. If we curl with HTML, we'll get HTML. So this is what the, essentially what our matrix looks like. So in order to know whether or not a template has been cached, we have to maintain these cache keys. Part of the cache key is the format. Uh, actually, I have a list of all of them. The, the cache key is the local variables because that impacts the generated code. Uh, we have the format, the locale, because you can have like a dot JP or a .en or ES on the template name, uh, and also the, the ver format and variant, like if you have an iPhone, that can also impact the file name, so we have to know all of those things. But unfortunately, we can't know those things in advance. We have to wait until it's actually being rendered to look those things up and then say, oh yes, this is compiled or not. So this is another hurdle for us compiling templates in advance. And we, we also have some strange render behavior that I want to I demonstrate here. Uh, let's say we have the same controller, uh, but now we have some partials in here. We don't have an XML index anymore, just an XML H, or an index HTML. But we have two sub-templates here, a ping.erb and an xml.erb. And if we look at the index HTML, that, that's what it looks like. It just says render my template. And inside the ping one, it says, I guess this is a ping. And inside the XML one, it says XML is cool. So when we, when we render this template, which one of these do you think will get rendered? Like when we make a request, which one of these my templates is going to get rendered? Don't answer. Just think. Just think. We're gonna show, I'm going to show you. So if we say, give me XML, uh, we're going to get an error saying, hey, there's no index XML. If we just do a normal curl, it's going to render the ping. So it, it renders index HTML ERB, and it, says it renders the ping ERB. If we request HTML, we actually get an error saying, hey, there's no HTML templates. 
I tried rendering HTML. If we use a browser, we also get an error trying to render. This is what the browser looks like. It's like, hey, there's no, I tried to render my template, but there's no HTML version of the my template. So the bad thing about this is, if you look at this, this template, we cannot predict what this render will do. Is this going to render a ping? Is it going to raise an error? We don't know. So this is very, very strange behavior in my opinion. The other thing is, okay, here we go. Let's say we have this control. This is our bare render controller. We rendered an index. Now let's say we do format.html. Maybe, I'm sure you've seen this before if you do any Rails development, you're like, I have different formats, I'll form, do an HTML one. If we do this, if we do this new version and we run that entire test matrix again, then actually the, the responses are more consistent. We get an error for the XML one, and then we every other request gets an HTML error because we're trying to render HTML. Now, <clears throat> if you think about this behavior, I think it's kind of crazy. Uh, this behavior, this behavior of this call to render here, this call to render depends on what context this render is in. And if you're looking at this template, how do you know? How do you know what context you're being called? It means we cannot look at this template and understand what it will do next. So in other words, templates are not context free. And I've been going on and on about prediction and consistency with template behavior, and now I want to talk about why. So in this case, we have, this is our, our graph of the logic that's going on. Uh, after doing performance testing on our systems at work, we found that, unfortunately, um, compiling and asking whether or not a template is compiled, that's cheap. Calling the method is cheap, but actually finding the template inside the cache is very expensive because we have to have all these keys. So it would be nice if we could get rid of that, if we could get rid of that step there. So in order to get rid of that step, what would be neat is if instead of looking up in that template cache, if we could just render, or if we could just put those method calls in there directly. So for example, in this case, we know, we know, based on all the previous knowledge in this presentation, that this render call is eventually going to boil down to just a method call. It's going to boil down to a unique method call. And if we knew what that unique method call was in advance, we could just put it right there. If we knew what that method call was, we could translate it into something like this, where we, we just call some randomly generated method, but we know what it is, and we don't have to look in the cache anymore. If we knew that, we could say, oh, you know what, I don't even need this step anymore, because we already know. And in fact, we wouldn't need any of these steps, because we already know. That is a very slow transition. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> this is the first time I've given this talk, so you can't tell. Oh my god. <laughs> Let's wait for this transition to crumble. <laughs> I'm a trained professional right here. So anyway, the, it means that we wouldn't need any of those steps anymore. Unfortunately, it would slow down production boot time because we would compile things in advance, but that could be eliminated by bootstrap. We could cache that. Uh, it would lower our memory because we could compile everything in the, in the parent process, and we would actually have a faster runtime because we no longer need to check this cache anymore. So I want to take kind of a detour. I know we started late, but I'm going to do it anyway. Ha, 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 sorry, Jeff. <laughs> Just like, oh, All right, so I was researching. <laughs> oh, that's oh, we started on a detour. Yes, yeah, so I'm taking a detour from a detour. <laughs> so I, I want to, like, what this prediction technique that I'm talking about, we actually use it at work. So it's, it's one of the things we use on our application at work, and it's one of the things that I'm working to upstream. So part of the responsibilities my team does is take stuff that we have in GitHub that's not really core to our, our business and upstream it, make it open source. Uh, and we want to we wanna upstream this and we want to make it open source, so I've been researching how to do that, which is why I'm talking a lot about Action View today. Uh, but I, in doing this research, I ran into a very strange issue, so I actually filed a ticket for it, which you can look up when I later close it, and you'll see why. So we have three templates here. We have a that these two templates on the left, they both render the template on the right. They, they're both collection rendering. Now, uh, that list of customers, that is a list of active record objects that are customer objects, and there are a thousand of them, okay? Now, if you look 
at these two, you may think to yourself, okay, which one of these is going to be faster? We have the one on the very left that does no catching, and then we have the one in the middle that says catch the true. So we're going to do some catching. Now, which one of these two templates is going to be faster? Which one of these is going to be faster? Obviously, the one on the left is going to be faster, because if it was the one in the middle, I wouldn't be talking about this. <laughs> <laughs> so this one is the slow, the slow version. <laughs> the slow one, the, the, the cash one is the slow one. And you can go look at the benchmark here. I'm not gonna post, I'm not gonna put it in the slides, it's kind of long, this is the issue. Uh, you can go, you can go check it out. But I will show the benchmark here. Actually, the the one with cash is 5.6 times slower than the one without cash. I when I was I was running this benchmark, I was convinced, I was convinced the cash didn't work. I was convinced, convinced, I was convinced it did not work. How can it work? It's five times slower. What is this? So I started debugging it, and I found that there, there were entries in the cache. It was querying the cache, and it was hitting the cache. So I said, okay, well, I guess I have to profile this now. So I profiled the cache, and it turns out, like, the, you don't need to read these. I'm just showing you that I actually did some work. <laughs> so I profiled it and I found that what, the, what this actually is, the very top, that top frame there, what it's doing is it's actually calculating a cache key. It's calculating the key for the cache. It turns out that cache key calculation was more expensive than just rendering the template. So then I had to figure out, okay, where is the payoff? I know we're getting cache hits. But it's kind of like, there has to be some sort of payoff. So I, I figured that out. The, the old template is on the left, the new template is on the right, and I had to do this much work in order for the caching to pay off. So this is our, this is our template that run, runs a thousand times or whatever. Uh, if we benchmark this, then the two are about the same, the cached and the non-cached version. So they're, they're same-ish there. Which means that you need to increase, like, if you're going to cache a template, you need to have a very complex template that does a bunch of stuff. So, in other words, what you can learn from this, cache does not mean fast. And with that, I want to talk about making render fast. So I think we have a couple of choices for making render fast. We can always make this render call, I think we can either always make the render call fast, or we can make it usually fast. And I'm going to talk about making it usually fast, because I think that this, making it usually fast, will have the smallest impact on existing applications today. So the technique I want to use for making it usually fast is something I'm calling the same format assumption. And what that essentially is, is if we're inside of an HTML template, so this index.html.erb, and we've specified a format, we know it's going to render a page. So we know that one in advance. Okay, so we can calculate that method in advance. But what I want to say is, here, if we're inside of an HTML template, we're going to assume that if an HTML template exists that matches that name, that's the one that we're going to render. That's going to be our hit. Okay? I think this is actually a safe assumption to make, actually. I'm pretty sure that 99% of HTML templates that render other templates, they have corresponding HTML templates as well. And if you don't have one, you probably specify the format. Now, in the case of the ambiguous render, ambiguous render problem, in this case, we have a render my template. It's inside of an HTML template. And if we look at the file system, we see, oh, we have like pings. Sometimes we get a ping. Sometimes we get an exception, as we saw from our test earlier. So we don't know. In this case, we don't know what the behavior of this one is. So we, cannot, we can't do anything for performance in this case. So we know that, we know that this one may actually render or may be a ping. This one, of course, will always raise an exception because there's no, there's no my template with an HTML format. So the question is, do we treat these two the same? Can we, can we do that? And I think the answer is no, we can't do that because of backwards compatibility. If we did that, then your entire application would explode and people would be mad at me, so I don't want to do that. If we did that, uh, we would, if we could do that, then we would have what I would call an always optimized situation, where we know we know what the render is going to do, and we can always optimize. But I don't want to break people's applications, so I don't think I will do that. This it would allow us to optimize. It would allow us to optimize uh, every case, but it would also break existing apps, and I don't think that's good. So my theory for this same format assumption is that 
in 99% of cases, 99% of templates, we do not have an ambiguous render issue. It's just not a thing. It's not ambiguous. Most of the time, we'll have HTML templates. Most of the time, we'll be able to predict them. And this is also the same. This We found this to be true in our, in our application at work. So I think the same format, if we, if we use the same format assumption, we can take this index HTML ERB and then translate it into direct method calls like this. So in this case, uh, where we have it, where we have an ambiguous render issue, when we go to optimize it, we say, well, you know what? I don't actually know what this is going to, what this is going to translate to. So the optimized template will just look like this. We'll stick with the regular render. It'll go through the, the slow process uh, or the slow rendering process and then just maintain the existing behavior. So to wrap this up, uh, I presented here some things we do at GitHub, uh, but we haven't put them up upstream yet. Because of corner cases, I'm working to eliminate these corner cases, which is part of this, this uh, presentation here today. And I want to end with a few lessons that we can learn just in general from, from this talk. First off is, when you're writing code, be context-free. Don't depend on side effects. It's important that you're able to look at your code and reason about it in isolation, so you don't need to think about the rest of the system. The systems that you're working on are going to be so complex that you can't keep the entire thing in your mind, and the only thing, the best thing that you can do is focus on this one particular case. And if you have to take into account context, you'll have too much mental overhead to understand what's going on. The other thing is to be consistent. Uh, calling a function should always have the same behavior. That is, this is essentially the same thing I was saying on the last slide, but those, those render calls that behave differently depending on some other render call over here, I don't think that that's a good behavior. We don't want that. We want to be able to look at our code and say, hey, I called this function. I know it's going to do this. And it'll always do that. Another thing, lesson learned, hash does not mean fast. <laughs> it does not, hopefully it's faster, but that's not necessarily true. And the only way we know is to benchmark first. So always be benchmarking your applications, looking for the actual bottlenecks. If I had benchmarked my toy application, I would know this is actually not a bottleneck and I don't really care to cache it. I mean, you're not actually going to cache that that template in production, uh, but you need to, you need to be uh, benchmarking in order to understand where to put these. Finally, this is, I know this is Rails specific, make your locals match, do it, it'll lower your memory overhead. Happy Friday everybody, thank you so much for having me here. Uh, first question was about what you're saying with instance variables in templates, yes. linting to ensure that they're not used. In the examples, you were looking at partial templates. Yep. Is that true also of the of the top level templates? The top level templates. So it, that's that's a very good question because it's it's tough to pass. Like you define all these instance variables in your controller, and then typically the top level the top level template will access those instance variables. At work, we don't we don't allow that. But so I do how I do understand the pain. Yeah. How do you how else? What is your preferred way to get that data into the top level template? So the way we do it at work, the way we do it at work is we, we pass in essentially one one local, and that local is a view a view object. We construct a I will set this down. We just construct an object. We construct an object that contains all the instance variables or all the context that we yeah. need to know about that template, and then pass that one thing in and call methods on it. Which is nice. It's nice for us from a uh, testing perspective as well because we can just test the behavior of that that yeah. object alone. It, so this is like an area of my interest, I would say, in uh, view templating and so forth. There's, in, in my eyes, like there's always a challenge with view templates that you're essentially changing the paradigm of your programming, right? Where we go from uh, typically very object-oriented work on the back end, and then as soon as you get to a template, it's what, what I would call like a functional, uh, the functional approach, right? Like yeah, our templates today continue to look almost like PHP templates and that we're kind of merging them, right? Like, is is that fair? And is that fair characterization first? And then second, like with now 14 years of Rails or so, 13 years, 13, whatever, was that the right way to do it? Uh, that's a, actually, that's a very, very good question. Um, I think you're, you're absolutely right in your description, description of the templates. And we are like, it's kind of weird because if you look at 
If you look at how we actually compiled those templates, like we went through the presentation today, you'll see that they're all just methods on an object. So we're technically doing, a, oh, it's just you can't see. Like you can't see it. Uh, in my opinion, I don't think we're doing it right. Uh, we have, so another, another motivation for this presentation is that somebody, somebody here in Denver who actually gave a, gave a presentation at the Boulder RV, I think, he, he gave a presentation about a different way of doing, different way of doing views, um, more sort of React style, I guess. I don't know any React, so I'm just taking his word for it. Uh, React style views, and he wants to implement that in Rails too, and I've been working with him on doing that. Essentially the change would be like, you'd say render, and then you'd give a class name, and then some data that you want to pass to that class, and it would automatically instantiate that class. And if you go look at the class, it will have a, an ERB template inside of it that'll get that'll get rendered, and you can actually test those in isolation and do whatever you want to with them. Whether or not that would get um, accepted in Rails, I don't know. I mean, I, I, the technique that we're working on together, I think it's way better. I think it's much better. It enforces the isolation, the data isolation. You literally can't see the other instance variables, so it's not limited, which is good. So I think that's a better style, but I don't know if it'll ever be in core. Yeah, it's interesting, right? With, with the the problem that's being approached here is like create very complex long strings. Yep. So do you want to write a complex long thing and then turn it into some complex code and output a complex string, or write complex code like you could do all kinds of insane string interpolations and say like, oh, we have object-oriented uh, view view rendering now but drive yourself insane with, with mm -hmm. string interpolation and multi ways, right? So yep. it's kind of, I, I think sometimes people can look at problems like this and be like, this sucks, we should do it different. But again, coming back to like one of the points that kept coming up yesterday, is like you're just trade, you can trade off, but this is gonna be an ugly problem no matter what yep. you do. Yes, yes, it's absolutely an ugly problem no matter how you tackle it, it's not gonna be fun. Last question for me is, historically the view layer in Rails specifically uh, my impression has always been that it is the, the spaghetti that no one wants to touch, which is also historically like the places where you end up uh, individually, right? <laughs> like, the code that everyone else is like, yeah, fuck it, it's like, it's hopeless, just, just leave it be. Is this, is this now going to be your, your passion area? Like you will I feel do so this. seen. <laughs> 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 uh, is this going to be the next like five years of your life? Is profiling uh, action view and uh, uh, so so yeah your <laughs> your characterization is like one hundred percent on <laughs> kills me. <laughs> yes, it is. It is terrible. It is, it is terrible spaghetti code that nobody wants to touch. And I like looking at the Git history on it. I'm like, this is this is old. Yeah. Uh, but There's been almost no change, right? Like a view template today. You could take back to Rails 1.0, and it would basically right. Yeah. yeah, there's been there's been hardly any hardly any change in it, and I think that's actually for the worse. I, I think that, in my opinion, the the code is so complicated that nobody understands it and wants to touch it. Uh, so yeah, I think that will be that is my next area or my next area of focus right now. But I don't think it's going to be as long and arduous a journey as working on Active Record. I think once we get this like. Once we get it to the point where we can take the, um, uh, the stuff that, the optimizations that we're doing in GitHub and upstream those into, into Rails, I think we'll actually be in a really good, really good position, so. Hey Aaron, I'm DJ. Thanks for Hi. the talk. Thank um, you. I don't know how to ask this without sounding kind of like obtuse and kind of like a jerk, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's actually my life with DJ right now. <laughs> <laughs> Do it, uh, I can take it. So it's 2019. Mm -hmm. Why are we still talking about Rails views? I feel like everybody writes JavaScript for the front end now. I mean, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, th that's true. I think a lot of people, a lot of people are just writing JS on the front end, but there's still a lot of people using Rails views, and we use them a lot of work, so that's why I'm looking at it. 
Do you have any advice for someone who wants to be involved in the Ruby or Rails projects as a new committer to open source? Where could they get started here? If you know, by chance. Don't. You don't got to do it. Let me think. Uh, it depends. So it depends. Like, it depends on what you want to do. A lot of people say, so, I would recommend starting at the edges. Don't go directly for Rails. A lot of people get started, a lot of people, excuse me, a lot of people say you should get started with documentation, but I personally hate doing documentation. <laughs> As you can tell from my amazing documentation. <laughs> uh, I, I prefer doing programming. And if you prefer doing programming too, uh, it's very difficult to get actually started on Rails, and I'll tell you why. The reason is because as soon as we get the issue file, if the issue is easy, somebody hops on it and fixes it already, because it's such a popular project. Uh, you'll have better chances if you go for dependency, things that Rails depends on. So go look at all the things that Rails depends on. Go look at those gems, those things, because the issues on those, they'll be more likely to have easy things that you can get started with. So I would recommend starting there. And once you start there, uh, you'll get more familiarity with the uh, you'll start working your way up to getting more familiarity with Rails for itself, and in that case, you'll be able to solve more complex problems in Rails, and then uh, be able to contribute in that case too. So start at the edges and work your way in. It's my my advice. There's this great project called No Kokiri. You go with it. Was the quote about XML and violence? Is that your quote? No. Okay. No. It's, it's one of the, my favorite quotes. In all it's world. it's oh that's an old like bash.org thing. Hey Aaron, I'm curious what uh, ramifications for Hamel or Slim or something like that it would have because the lookup obviously has nothing to do with which of those libraries you're using, but it seems like there'd be have to change have changes in those libraries upstream too. Uh no, I think we those libraries wouldn't have to make any changes at all. We could continue so. All the changes required in order to do this, what I'm talking about, are basically static analysis on the ERB. So um, that's all going to be inside of the ERB, ERB compiler itself, so it shouldn't impact any other, any other templating systems. It'll probably just mean that ERB is way faster than the other. And ERB inside of Rails will be way faster than other engines inside of Rails. But that said, those other template engines could apply, absolutely apply the same technique. So, I think there's like a, a reasonable case coming back to DJ's question, where like template rendering is ugly no matter where you do it, and like someone has to construct templates. It might be the case that you're even if you're not using ERB as like your primary tool, you might be using it in a service and like fetching those template fragments over the API or whatever. There's like a lot of the, the essential problem that ERB is attacking remains no matter where we're doing our computation. Somebody's got to do it. Somebody's got to Somebody, do it. Somebody's got to concatenate the string. <laughs> <laughs> strings, man. Strings out, strings back. Yeah. Thank you, Aaron. Oh, thank you so much.